I now declare the second plenary of the series open, and I'd like to introduce our speaker with two rapidly obsoleting types of technology. <laughs> so, the first is probably the kind of biography that you're coming to hear, which is that our speaker, Professor Jeffrey Rockwell, is a professor of philosophy and humanities computing at the University of Alberta, and that he is interim director of the Cool Center for Advanced Studies, is that Institute. The Institute for Advanced Studies. He's also the director of the Canadian Institute for Research in Computing and the Arts. Um, you are probably familiar with his role as project leader of paper, where you've seen some buttons around. I've got more, um. <laughs> for those who are buttonless. Um, which is uh, an acronym that, that stands for something including a text analysis portal, probably the R is for certain. Yeah. Um, and he also conducted a workshop here yesterday, seemingly a year ago, on um, Voyant tools. So he's been centrally involved in tools building um, for the digital humanities, or humanities computing as he seems to prefer to call it, um, for the last 15 years. I have known Jeff, we have determined now, um, for 17 years. And here's the proof. Notice the yellow patina of age. This is the Center for Electronic Texts in the Humanities summer seminar at Princeton. And I read um, the instructor Jeffrey Rockwell, um, who's completing a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Toronto, is an in, uh, in, uh, instructor for a track called Hypertext for the Humanities. Building and using hypercard stacks and worldwide web documents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you like to more? <laughs> Where was that? Yeah, the historic, you know, sort of rerun courses or like. Uh, so I, I just, I just like to pass this around. It's, it's, uh, it's quite, quite a document. Um, my handwriting was a lot better than I'm noticing too. But anyway. Uh, without further ado, I'm really glad you're here, Jeff. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, uh, I, I remember that summer in Princeton. It was <laughs> very hot, and our dorm room had no air conditioning. David Greenbaum and I just were sweltering. Just sweltering. I was sitting there going, how can a you know, Princeton is so rich and have such a lousy dorm room? <laughs> anyway, on March 10th, 2004, in what must be one of the most dramatic moments in the history of government surveillance, two representatives of the Bush White House, the then White House Counsel Alberto Gonzalez and the White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card, arrived at Attorney General John Ashcroft's hospital bed at the George Washington University Hospital, arrived at his hospital bed to try to convince a very sick Ashcroft to certify that a presidential th authorization was legal, an authorization that allowed potentially, and in fact, definitely illegal activities that, among other things, bypassed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, set up to warrant, uh, which was set up to make sure that uh, the NSA didn't spy on you or be. So, Ashcroft had been signing on <laughs> to the form and legality of these presidential authorizations that allowed the NSA to bypass the FISA court for a while. The presidential authorizations were reissued every 45 days or so, and the Attorney General was supposed to then sign off on their legality. In the aftermath of 9-11, the NSA had embarked on an ambitious set of secret intelligence activities that were part of the President's Surveillance Program, PSP, many of which were probably illegal because they bypassed FISA. The FISA court, provided a secret court that could quickly authorize wiretapping of Americans on American soil. But as secret and as efficient as it was, the White House felt that for the war on terror, they needed warrantless wiretapping without the delays of court oversight. 
With her existing authorization about to expire, the White House desperately needed the Attorney General to sign off, or they'd have to scale back some of the NSA's very expensive activities. <coughs> the problem was that Ashcroft and Deputy Attorney, uh, Deputy Attorney General James Comey, who was actually the Attorney General because Ashcroft was in the hospital, very sick, had come to the conclusion that some of the activities of the PSP were essentially illegal. They weren't legally justified, and they could not authorize its continuation, which is why when it became clear that Comey wouldn't sign, the White House sent these two officials off to the sick bed to try to get them to sign, bypassing the actual attorney general. They didn't count on Mrs. Ashcroft alerting Comey so he'd get there in time. They didn't count on a confrontation with a very sick Ashcroft who said, I'm not the attorney general, so I can't sign and I won't sign. And they didn't count on the threat of mass resignation when President Bush threatened and actually did go ahead, push ahead, uh, authorizing it himself. As Jane Bamford put it in The Shadow Factory, never in history had so many government officials threatened to resign to, to protest an administration's disregard for the law. Bush, remembering the Saturday night massacre during Watergate and heading into an election against Kerry, backed down and altered many of the NSA's illegal eavesdropping and data mining operations, though we still don't really know what they were doing or what they're doing now. Why do I bother to start with this story? The reason is to remind us what is at stake with big data. As William Sapphire wrote in an opinion in the New York Times about the Total Information Awareness Project, an earlier attempt to set up large-scale surveillance and data mining, Every purchase you make with a credit card, every magazine subscription you buy, and medical prescription you fill, every website you visit, every email you send or receive, every academic grade you receive, and I guess in our cases give, <laughs> every bank deposit you make, every trip you book, every event you send, all these sent transactions and communications will go into what the Defense Department describes as a virtual, centralized, grand database. Part of what I want to do today is to convince you that understanding big data, how that data is gathered, who gathers it, how it can be analyzed, is no longer an obscure issue in an equally obscure field like the digital humanities. I want to propose that the humanities have a responsibility, and for that matter, have always had a responsibility to think through the issues of how we know ourselves in concrete ways, whether through our literatures, histories, and now big data sets. In particular, I want to survey what can be done with all this data. In this paper, I'm not going to worry about exactly what our governments are gathering or exactly what they're doing with what they gather. Thankfully, the Fifth Estate and organizations like the EFF and EPIC are doing a pretty good job of monitoring their activities. In fact, I think they're doing a better job than comparable organizations in Canada. Instead, I want to ask what we humanists can do with big data as a way of thinking through or experimenting with the techniques that may be applied to our information. In a sense, what can we do as a way of learning what is being done to information about us? I'm going to start with some hints from what we hear about the very best funded projects, namely those intelligence projects set in motion uh, even before 9-11. Asking what agencies with immense resources can do with analytics is my way of opening the question of what we could do with similar data or other data. The short answer is there are two types of analysis that are typically performed on big data, depending on two major forms of data. The two types of information analyzed are information in motion and information at rest. Let's look at these two. Information at rest is what we usually think of as big data and what we usually worry about when we worry about data mining. It is all the large databases of information about people and things is not the real-time flow of data, but the structured and curated data gathered over the years and mined for insight. Here at a large university, you probably have a number of such large databases, from personnel to student databases to library circulation databases. One could even say that the sum of all the University of Kansas websites is a large distributed and messy data set representing research and learning here. Interestingly, we are the conspirators in many of these really large databases. If you use a loyalty card at your local supermarket, that gets you discounts 
and at the same time, you're contributing to a commercial database that gathers information about your purchasing habits, which can be correlated with the personal information you provided, and then credit card information, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you upload something to YouTube, you're contributing to a massive multimedia database. If you have a Facebook account, you're contributing to a large social graph of who is friends with who, what they say they like, what they say they are doing, and so on, and so on. <coughs> What can be done with this data? Well, a lot of the uses of this data are fairly benign, and many modern, and any modern consumer probably already has a sense of how stores, for example, are using the data to put impulse buy products in key locations. And if you have kids, you've noticed how certain doodads that they would love to chew on or have you buy are often placed within reach of them as you're standing in line in the checkout phase. The general idea is what is called market basket analysis, where you look at what products are being bought at the same time, uh, what products are, in effect, in the same basket. A common and possibly untrue story about what can be discovered is the beer and diaper story, which uh, some of you have probably uh, heard about. Um, and it's probably an urban myth, though there's some interesting stories, uh, there's some interesting discussions about whether or not it really did happen. Um, and the purported analysis showed that on Friday and Saturday evenings, many baskets contained what otherwise seemed like a strange combination of beer and diapers. The inference is that husbands are being sent out on the weekend to pick up some more diapers, and while they're in the store, they're also picking up some beer on impulse. The commercial advantage of such data mining insight provide, that such data mining insight provides is that it might help beer sales if you make sure that the beers near the diapers are on the way back to the checkout counter from the diaper section. Social, networks anal social network analysis, such as one might do on a social graph, is similar. The analysis is looking for correlations between phone numbers, websites, email addresses, people, places, and activities. You can imagine the intelligence uses. Who's hanging out with known terrorists? Are, what are the places they go to? Are there any unusual items that they're buying, like large amounts of fertilizer? Are there any unusual activities that they're, that they're pursuing, like taking flying lessons? I'm gonna to return to information at rest, because that is what most of us are likely to try doing in the humanities. Information in motion is the information that is in transit over communication channels, be they fiber optic cables or satellites or your local Wi-Fi. This is the massive flow of phone conversations, emails, web page requests, and various internet transactions of different sorts. The, in the independent technical review of the carnivore system, final report of 2000, prepared by the IITRI, and I'm not gonna spell out what that means, has some nice graphics to show how this is done. And this is one of them. Essentially, you tap into a network and listen in on the traffic filtering and sifting for the information that meets various uh, requirements. So for example, I had an off-the-record conversation with someone who was partly responsible for a, uh, uh, a sort of uh, a data hotel at the bottom of Lake Ontario, and one of the things he pointed out to me is that there was a room being run by the Canadian Secret Service, the CSIS, and the, or the RCMP, and they, uh, because this was a point at which a lot of the fiber that goes around the bottom of Lake Ontario goes, they probably, almost certainly, had a tap in that fiber and then had some sort of system that was watching all the traffic going through and essentially looking for various patterns, phone numbers, email addresses, so on, so on, and so on, and then where they found a pattern that was something they were interested in, they were sucking it up, storing it, and making it available to an analyst who would then you know, have to look at it and decide if it was actually of any use. Um, as the amount of information traveling on major trunk lines is phenomenal, you need specialized filters, specialized systems to filter information in motion in real time. Essentially, these systems are a combination of signal processing hardware that can handle the flow of information tapped into, along with software that watches for lists of phone numbers, names, words, phrases, and addresses. These systems don't gather everything. There's too much going through. They're simply trying to find the right stuff and then make it available to the analysts who might do something with it. This, uh, here you go. That is a great sound. I'm, I'm coming to appreciate it more now. Uh, and it's 
a warning about something. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from that same uh, report, and what you see here is the visual basic interface where an analyst can set up a filter. And for those of you who are interested in these sort of technical things, I encourage you to see this report is online. And you can go in and, and you know, you can probably imagine all the stuff is there. What protocols do you want to capture? TCP, UDP, ICMP. Uh, do you want to filter on data text strings? Do you want to trigger a full session? You know, if you find some, uh, some word that you're, you're tracking, do you want to then sort of start grabbing all this stuff? Uh, TCP ports that you want to watch. Uh, email addresses that you might want to filter on. Startup IDs, DHCP <coughs> and so on and so on. So this is, uh, uh, this is from the carnivore system, which I should say, by the way, is, is, out of, is an out of date uh, system. If you think this is just for governments, think again. Neris sells a product which may or may not be similar to what they sell to the government called Neris Insight for real-time semantic analysis. Um, and this, by the way, <coughs> this is a third-party tap. In other words, you don't do the tap. Somebody else has put the tap because that's probably illegal. And the t you're tapping into routers, wireless, uh, <coughs> behind firewalls, various stuff goes in and then you have um, uh, you have the sort of uh, intelligent traffic analysis, data collection, the analytics engine, so on, so on, so on. And one of the things they say on their website, and I encourage you to go and, and look at <coughs> Neris.com, Neris Insight is Neris's flagship product and is the most scalable real-time traffic intelligence system for the protection and management of large IP networks. It captures, analyzes, and correlates IP traffic in real time and offers wide visibility across heterogeneous networks and deep insight into multiple layers of network traffic in real time. One of, you can imagine one of the major problems of this type of uh, information in motion gathering is that the information doesn't come in nice little packets <coughs> email. Messages. It's almost of separate packets, and if you actually want to grab an email message, you need to sort of grab all the related packets, reassemble it, and sometimes the packets are not going through the same wires and so on. Similarly, similarly, there are now commercial services that provide real-time monitoring or strategic intelligence of social media, like visible GNIP and data set. This is similar <coughs> to the old news clipping services that help companies manage their brand. Here is Twitter on their partner Dataset. Dataset is a real-time media curation platform allowing you to mine the Twitter fire hose of tweets matching the specific criteria of your choice. Dataset's custom curation stream definition language. I would I would love to teach a course on how to program it. Custom uh, curation stream definition language. Anyway, it allows you to filter based on any metadata within a tweet, in addition to a number of other data providers from around the web. And they have a special relationship with Twitter. This is one of the ways that Twitter is monetizing their investment. Uh, I would love to. I'd love to have a student do do a study of, uh, of some of the metaphors. Uh, one of the metaphors that shows up in a lot of this stuff is the flow of water. And of course, if you've got a flow that is explosive, it's usually in a fire hose. And sure enough, Twitter actually has a service called Twitter Fire Hose, uh, which gives you a sort of almost visceral sense of what's going on in terms of the amount of information that's uh, passing through. For that matter, the Internet Archive, and somebody raised this, I think, in one of the sessions I was in this morning, has a service used by librarians, including at the University of Alberta, called Archive, that will scrape websites on a regular basis, not real-time traffic capture and analysis, but at least it is ongoing web scraping for archival purposes, and one of the things we're experimenting with is how to then pass that information to Poyant in a sort of very core humanist version of real-time uh, text analysis. What does this mean for us? What does it mean for the humanities in general and the digital humanities in particular? Well, there are obvious privacy issues, and I don't need to dwell on them here. The liberal arts, uh, but uh, what I do want to argue is that the liberal arts are supposed to be those disciplines that prepare free, and that is the meaning of liberal in this context, free people for a, not for a particular profession, and that would be the servile arts, but, also, but for citizenship and participation in a democratic community. Some of what we try to do in educational institutions that claim to be the liberal arts is not just prepare people for jobs, but prepare them to be thinking, participa participating citizens. Big data is now a fact, 
of how citizens are managed, both by industry and government. Shouldn't the liberal arts then study and teach about big data and its analysis? I would propose that some level of big data literacy is rapidly becoming a necessity in the big information age. How can the digital humanities contribute? The rest of this paper will drop down from the heights of distant criticism to the pragmatics of thinking through. I use the phrase thinking through for an approach of understanding a phenomena, thinking about it, through the practices of making, experimenting, and fiddling. I am of the camp that believes that one of the unique ways that the digital humanities can contribute to the larger dialogue of the humanities is through what Titor Landi and later Willard McCarty call modeling. We create models of systems and learn through the making and then reflecting on those models. And we often learn by noticing and appreciating all the ways they fail. And one of the good, one of the good news items I want to share with you about big data and data mining is it fails over and over again in all sorts of interesting ways. So, first of all, we had big data before. Um, it's not actually a new problem. For example, the perception that there is too much information, a fire hose, and therefore we need some new technology to help us manage it, goes back to the story of the invention of writing in Plato's Phaedrus. But one of the interesting aspects of this story that gets missed is the division of labor imposed by King Themis on this situation. He, Socrates, Socrates through him, proposes that the inventors of technology, the engineers, are not necessarily the best at judging its utility or potential. I think the same holds true today, that humanists, among others, should be engaged in thinking through information technology, especially technologies that promise to help us manage the continual flood of new information. In modern days, this problem opens Vannevar Bush's As We May Think, where he says there is a growing mountain of research. This is 1945. So, you know, the problem of too much information has been around for a long time. Um, Plato, I, I left over all sorts of interesting Renaissance uh, technologies for managing information. Anyway, Vannevar Bush says a growing mountain of research but there is, an increase, there is increased evidence that we are being bogged down today as specialization extends. The investigator is staggered by the findings and conclusions of thousands of other workers, conclusions which he cannot find time to grasp, much less to remember as they appear. You probably all know that experience of getting too much email, so much email that you have to sign up for a VAT camp in order to get away to do any original thinking. <laughs> More recently, Clay Shirky has spoken on the subject, arguing that the problem is filter failure. We've also seen humanities projects dealing with big data for some time. James Murray and other editors of the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, had to deal with millions of quotation slips without any computing, just with pieces of paper, boxes, rooms, and so on. As for humanities computing projects, an important early project that doesn't get the attention it deserves, probably because it was a French project, was the Frontex text database assembled starting in the 1970s to provide examples for a massive linguistic study of the French language over time, the Trésor de la langue française. Here in North America, we have access to it through Artful. If you looked at Artful, that's actually, uh, they've, they've added a lot of stuff to it, but it started as the, um, at, well, and Artful stands for Archive de la Trésor de la langue française. Etienne Brunet, in a 1989 article in Jury Linguistic Computing titled L'Exploitation des Grands Corpus, le Bestiaire de la Littérature Française, which I translate as The Exploitation of, large corp of a large corpora, of large corpora, the bestiary of French li literature, talks about what one can do with a terminal connection to Frantex using the Stella system designed to search it. At the same, and remember this is pre web, so. Uh, uh, in fact, Artful had packaged up a similar sort of uh, terminal uh, program to connect to the Artful thing. Uh, and back in my days at U of T, I actually had to support that. And it was, thank God, nobody actually wanted to use it because it was a nightmare. <laughs> anyway, at that time, Frontex had about 2,500 full texts of French literature from 1700 to the 20th century. Um, one of the interesting things is how those 2,500 texts were chosen in a, in a Move, uh, in a move that was probably typical of that time and the, the people working with it, they chose the important 2,500 texts. 
I think I don't think the issue of uh, canon debates had, had gotten to print at that point. But anyway, this may not seem like big data now, but in the 1980s, when most of us were lucky to have a full text of a single work, or at most a small collection by a single author, at that time Quantex was dramatically different. It was big, much bigger than anything else we had, and it provoked Brunet to speculate on and try new methods. What does Brunet say we can do with this type of big corpora? Well, Brunet talks about a disequilibrium between our breadth of ambitions and the smallness of the data we use. He was particularly talking about what was very popular at that time, which was authorship attribution. He was basically saying, you, know, you guys are all trying to do this authorship stuff, and you're working with single text or very small collections. He, he essentially makes the case for big data, what Franco Moretti will later call distant reading. He makes the point that big data allows analysis by comparison. You have in big data all sorts of control samples. If you want to look at one author, you have other authors to compare it to. He makes the point that statistical analysis only works on a large scale. You should draw statistically, you, you should, you, you shouldn't draw statistical inferences from small data sets, something which a lot of the people at that time were doing because of the immense amount of labor it took to get anything bigger than a couple texts. He made a bizarre correlation of the value of textual statistics to the power of the collective in identikits, which is why I have that funny little face up there. Uh, in French, they're called uh, robo-portraits. And the idea was, it took me a long time uh, to figure out what he was talking about, was that a robo-portrait has input from many different people. We have a suspect. Uh, we don't actually have a photograph of the suspect, but we have many people who saw the suspect and they give us lots of sort of data points and we use that to build a automated portrait of what the real phenomena is. And that was his image, along with a series of interesting culinary images, for what was possible with these large uh, uh, data sets. Most importantly, he gives us a number of examples of looking at a theme. And the theme he was looking at in that particular essay was bestiary, animals, and, and so like that. And there's a whole series, if you go to the article, there's a whole series of visualizations which are a good 20 years ahead of their time. Um, he was doing culturenomics long before Jean, whatever, Baptiste uh, came up to do it. Here's one of, the, one of the things. So what we're looking at here is horses, dogs, and cats. And you can see that dogs and cats sort of correlate. This is diachronic from 1800 to 1955, they sort of follow each other, but horses, you know, are really big, and then somewhere around 1865, they become less important than dogs and cats. And then, this is really cool, he compares, so you've got that, you've got that visualization, but here is the same information, but now by genre. And so you see, for example, dogs uh, show up a lot more in verse than uh, cats and horses don't show up that much. But otherwise, you've got some fairly similar sort of tracking that's going on. And uh, here's another. Uh, he uses factorial analysis um, to look at the sort of correlation or the clustering of individual authors and various animals. And among other things, he shows that Colette, uh, that Colette is sort of by the cluster, by this factorial analysis, is sort of pulled out to the side by cats. In fact, she has a dialogue on, uh, between a cat and a dog. And, and here's dog over there, and Hugo is up there with the chevre, with, I think that's sort of appropriate, with goats. Uh, you've got rabbits near Montpasson, so on, so on, so on. This is 1989, uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, at this point, uh, I am now going to take you through a sort of forced march through some of the opportunities and to a lesser extent, risks for big data in the digital humanities. I'm gonna do what a number of other people have done probably better, which is to give you a list of what I think are, you know, the sort of, you know, landmark places where there's interesting opportunities for big data in the humanities. I know that this list will be out of date by the time I walk out the door here, because all sorts of you are probably doing all sorts of cool stuff that doesn't show up there, and you're gonna, I hope you're gonna uh, freely tell me about it. Nonetheless, I think one always I should sort of try to provide some sort of overview. And I'm gonna sort of walk through some of these and give you for each one uh, maybe one example. Filtering and subsetting. Uh, this is, of course, what I talked about when I was talking about information in motion, and is something that the, the 
intelligence agencies of Canada, the US, and other countries are doing on a very large scale. But it is also of interest to us because we, we now have access through, for example, the Internet Archive to some very large data sets. And one of the first things that you need to do with these data sets is to extract from them a smaller data set which might actually be useful for a particular problem. And this is from the Cornell Web Lab. They were working with the Internet Archive. And this is uh, from one of the articles that they, uh, that they published showing their sort of subsetting system which allowed a social scientist or humanists to extract a subset that they could then analyze using the sort of tools that are at hand. So you're interested in uh, Cree, <coughs> you might want to sort of grab all the web pages that have to do with Cree uh, from Canada or something like that. Sequence alignment. This is, this I think is, is one of the ones that I think has the most potential. And um, it's one that, it's one that, uh, uh, Mark Olson has given papers at DH about, and this is in fact from a paper by Horton, Olson, and Rowe, um, titled Something Borrowed, Sequence Alignment in the Identification of Similar Passages in Large Text Collections. And what it is, is essentially the same thing that they do in Turnitin. You have some sort of text that you're interested in, and you use a sequence alignment algorithms coming out of genomics, where they have the sort of problem of trying to find patterns of DNA, uh, one pattern of DNA, similar patterns elsewhere in DNA. <coughs> and you go through an enormous text space, the bigger the better, looking for places where the target pattern might show up in some variant form. And you can do sort of fuzzier versions of sequence alignment. This particular example, uh, uh, they, took, they took a 20th century historian called Zaud, uh, and they took uh, a number of his texts and tried to see how much he had cribbed, mm -hmm. which is a fancy word for plagiarized, from the historical record. In fact, they discovered that he wasn't very good at uh, keeping track of his notes. But this, you know, using, thinking of this as a plagiarism detector, as a sort of gotcha tool, is not getting the point. What is really cool about this is we can begin to do, we can follow the expression of ideas over time in these large data sets. We can look at how certain canonical texts, including some that, you know, let's say uh, Boethius's Consolatio, how, how did the, that expression work its way out and through later philosophical works? And, uh, I mean, it takes massive computational power to do this, but we have it, or we have, some of us have it. Um, diachronic analysis, and this is, of course, related to the other one, and, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned the work that uh, Brunet was doing in the, in the 80s, and of course, uh, Jean-Baptiste Michel and his colleagues got a lot of attention for the science article on quantitative culture, on quali quantitative culture using millions of digitized books. And they worked with Google, and this is the Google Engram viewer. And I thought for, uh, you know, this is especially appropriate since you made some dig about how I still talk about the humanities computing, I want you to notice humanities <laughs> computing, and it's still going up, and digital humanities. Uh, the, uh, well, that puts me from oh, 2000, though. Yeah, <laughs> 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 the term digital humanities since then. <laughs> it, it has, actually. I, I didn't drop it in here, but uh, looking at humanist, uh, what's interesting is they're both going up. Uh, digital humanities definitely takes off at around uh, 2004, 2005. But humanities computing, it's not actually replacing humanities computing. Oh. It, in some interesting way, and I have some theories about it, and I'd have to look a little bit closer to the data. But anyway, this sort of diachronic study is something that we can do with big data. Classification and clustering. This is a rich family of techniques. You saw that factor analysis uh, visualization which is essentially factor analysis, is one form of multivariant analysis, which is a sort of family of te statistical techniques that you can use when you have a population of too many things to sort of ask, do these things cluster in some way? Or if I train my system to recognize irony, can I then pass it various other things and it'll sort of classify ironic, not ironic, ironic, not ironic, and something like that. This is, uh, this is from, um, the correspondence analysis tool that we have built into Voyant. 
uh, and it is the 20 odd years of humanists, 87 to I think it is 2009 or 10. And uh, one of the nice things about uh, correspondence analysis, unlike other MBA techniques, is that it sort of folds two anal uh, an analyses together. So you have both, if you will, if you think of this as a large table where you have the years across the top and then all the high frequency words uh, uh, across the bottom and other techniques like principal component analysis, you can either look at the years and how they cluster or the words and how they cluster. Correspondence analysis allows, us, allows you to sort of fold these spaces together and see if there are uh, correspondences between words and years. And so we're seeing the early years of the humanist discussion list, which you could say to some extent map onto what's happening in humanities computing. One of the things that's interesting is just the fact that they naturally, not naturally, but unnaturally, statistically sort of fall out in this curve, and then you can look at the words. And I apologize to those of you who took my uh, Voyant uh, workshop because I showed you this. And, and then you can begin to draw inferences about why would words like computer and software, English, why would they show up near the early years? And there's a whole mess of words that show up near, uh, near the years of uh, 1994 and on, uh, largely to 1998 and on. Social network analysis. This is also a Voyant tool. This is, again, the humanist list. Um, in this case, it's, uh, it, there's actually two techniques. So first, we're using the Stanford named entity uh, recognizer. So this is a tool that chugs through an enormous text. And every time it sees something that looks like a named entity, a person, a place, an organization, it uh, extracts the information about where it is. And in our particular case, we take uh, every time we see two people showing up in the same email message in Humanist, we create a link between them or we, you know, we augment the count on a link. And then we've provided a tool which allows you to sort of see who, who is showing up in the same emails, what people seem to be connected in the digital humanities. And if you play with this tool, uh, one thing which, a very important part to it is the really Willard Pi <laughs> feature, because if you don't turn that on, then Willard is connected to everything, because he's the <laughs> moderator of the list. Uh, but you can play with a number of people and you, you start incrementing them. And you see some things which uh, I was actually sort of going down memory lane. You know, Antonio Zampoli, Nancy Ide, I mean, they, and Nicoletta Calzoi. The, the, these were the important people in humanities computing at one point. They were, they were very important behind the TEI and so on like that. Uh, Paul Fortier in Lancashire, sort of at the edges of that. Michael Spurbin McQueen, Lou Bernard, co editors of the TI guidelines. Sebastian Ratz uh, is working with Lou at, and often doing a lot of the work uh, there. And then you see some false positives. Uh, Arun Kumar Tripathi was uh, doing a lot of work around philosophy and history of science and technology. Albert Borgman, I don't think he ever contributed to humanists, but Tripathi keeps on quoting him. <laughs> Likewise, if you know anything about Italian history, you'll know Aldo Moro was unlikely to have anything to do with humanities computing. He gets kidnapped by the Red Brigades in the 70s, and it's, it's 70s, 80s. It's the end of the Red Brigades because they, they kidnapped somebody who was far too popular. So Tito Orlandi, why are they connected? Well, Tito Orlandi must have had a whole bunch of messages early on in Humanist about uh, some study of Aldo Moro, and so on and so on and so on. There, you can't trust this data, but it is another technique that we can do. I, I actually think of this as something very related to or coming, something that I've been inspired by Greg Crane's idea of essentially first enriching the data. We've got lots of data, we've got automatic processes like the Stanford Named Entity Recognizer that can, we can use to go through and try to enrich it. And by enrichment, I mean recognizing names or stuff like that. And then once we've enriched it, we can begin to look at uh, the enrichment. And this, this is one way to look at, to visualize, if you will, the connections between people. The last one is one that you probably didn't expect to have show up here, and that's life tracking, or as, uh, um, I mean, one of the first terms used for this in 1996 was life stream. It was a, uh, life stream was a project at Yale by Eric Freeman and David Gelertner. Uh, later on, we had Gordon Bell at Microsoft has, uh, and is still ongoing, the My Life Bits project, and he calls that life logging. And recently, and this is where I got this from, uh, Stephen Wolfram has posted 
a very interesting blog essay about his analysis of all the data he's gathered about his own life. It is now possible to be tracking a bunch of this stuff. If you're a jogger, you can get the doodad from Nike so that you're tracking your, uh, tracking your jogging information. If you have a phone with a GPS, you can track where you're going. Uh, if you like to tweet a lot, there's a sort of Twitter trail following you around. You can be gathering a lot of stuff, and if you're Stephen Wolfram, you're gonna run that stuff through Mathematica and begin to add know yourself in a new and sort of bizarre way. And one of the things you discover about Stephen Wolfram, for example, is you know, the key, he's doing a lot of work. He has dinner about here, and then he works to something in the neighborhood of three in the morning. Yes, he works and, and he does a lot of phone calls after dinner and a lot of his email and keystrokes and so like that. But then you've got this other weird thing. He's doing a lot of walking uh, at the same time that he's uh, having uh, some meetings, uh, typing, and doing email in the morning. It turns out he's one of these people who has set up his computer on a treadmill so he can get his morning exercise while he does email and stuff like that. Um, I, you think that this sounds like it is funny. Uh, this is Gordon Bell and My Life Bits, and this is a device you can now buy. It's called a, wet, it's called a Sense Cam. It has an infrared transceiver on it. You walk around with it. When you get close to people where the light changes, it takes a picture. So you have a whole sequence of pictures from your day. Not a video feed, which you probably could get with some of those little doodads that you can get for your thing. But uh, you, you get a lot of pictures of the people you're meeting and so on like that. But uh, Ian Lancashire writes in Forgetful Muses uh, about a much more serious project that in some sense is along the same lines. Uh, he writes about devising diagnostic software for text analysis and longitudinal studies, not only of creative writing, but of email, diaries, blogs, and even conversation. <laughs> and this came out of a project where he looked at uh, the novels of Agatha Christie and tracked her growing dementia. Mm -hmm. And he, in effect, is proposing that, and, and he and Graham Hurst, working with medical researchers, have... Um, Demonstrate is too wrong, strong a word, but he has shown that you can see the early onset of, of Alzheimer's in somebody's writing. And he compares Iris Murdoch, uh, Agatha Christie, and P.D. James, different people for whom we have a large and long um, history of writing, some of whom we know had Alzheimer's, some of whom probably had it, but it wasn't diagnosed, and some of whom didn't have it. And there are various signs, basically vocabulary richness of early, of early onset. And uh, in effect, in Forgetful Muses, sort of ends it by calling for, you know, we should be collaborating with medical researchers in developing this sort of life logging, life analytic software to possibly help us understand when there are changes to ourselves. So, does it work? I want to close this talk by talking about some of the limitations of big data and big data analysis. I hope my opening alerted you to the privacy issues raised by big data and data mining. And I should mention, by the way, that many of us are creating databases that have very similar privacy issues. It's very easy to point your finger at other people, but some of us are creating, uh, many of you are librarians and are actually responsible for uh, collections databases that do actually have information about people's activities and what they're reading. And I'm sure you take that very seriously. Anyway, I'm not going to return to those, but the good news is that data mining, especially data mining of surveillance data, may not actually work very well. And the reason is what Jeff Jonas and Jim Hartner in a policy analysis published to the Cato Institute titled Effective Counterterrorism and the Limited Role of Predictive Data Mining, what they call uh, the sort of false uh, uh, positive problems, uh, problem. Um, do I have a slide? So first of all, what they're talking about is predictive data mining, which is what a lot of the surveillance, uh, especially the, motion, the information in motion is, where you're data mining not to sort of say not to gain insight into what was, but you're trying to predict what could be. Namely, you're trying to you know, catch people before they do something terrible. So that's predictive data mining. And he goes on to say, they go on to say, it would be unfortunate if data mining for terrorism discovery had currency within national security, law enforcement, and technology circles 
because, because pursuing this use of data mining would waste taxpayers' dollars, needlessly infringe on privacy and civil liberties, and <coughs> misdirect the valuable time and energy of the men and women in the national security community. The problem is, when you analyze lots of data, you get lots of false hits. This is fine for a commercial a company that is analyzing this data, and then one of the outcomes is they send junk mail out. So what if they send junk mail out to, you know, 50% of the hits are false or people that are not interested in their product. But if you're sending an expensive FBI agent out to track down every time you got one of these things, perhaps there's a better use of that agent's time. And in fact, in, in a Times, uh, in a cover story from Time, they talk about the Pizza Hut problem. When you're gathering all these phone numbers and building this social graph, you often find that a bunch of people who are suspects are all calling the same number. And you send out the API agent, and it turns out it's a pizza. They're ordering pizza. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I, you know, this is just one article. But my experience using uh, multivariate analysis and that network analysis is the amount of false positives are such that you should never have any confidence uh, you should never believe that that data proves anything. You need to always verify it, and you need to use it as a way of exploring and then investigating, uh, uh, as a way of exploring the data, finding anomalies, using those anomalies to then uh, explore it in other ways. The chances that big data and big data analytics are going to actually give, uh, give us some of the, the, the sort of quality of results that we need are, I believe, fairly low. But it's one of the things that, of course, um, people smarter than me will be working on and, and uh, maybe solving. So I want to end on a story about too many results and one that points at a different sense of uh, a different form of falsity uh, in the sense of a false friend. In May 2010, we ran a workshop at the University of Alberta on high performance computing, or HPC, in the digital humanities. High performance computing. Um, it used to be called supercomputing. I actually prefer the word supercomputing because it, it, I think, conveys some of what is actually going on because a high-performance computer today is somebody's desktop. Tomorrow, high-performance computing is usually about really neat computing that's out of your reach. That's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being sort of a bit flippant about it because there, there's actually a lot more to it than that. But uh, the point is, is having access to the compute power to be able to ask certain types of questions which your desktop could not, you could not process on your desktop unless you had thousands of years or hundreds of years. Anyway, uh, we brought together a number of teams and we provided them with HPC uh, support. It was a, bit, a little bit of a sort of half fest, except for instead of all of us hacking one thing, we had a bunch of teams with different projects and we kind of, uh, paired them up with our HPC folk and they prototyped various HPC applications. One team led by Patrick Juola adapted his idea for a conjecturator uh, so that it could be run on one of our University of Alberta HPC clusters. The conjecturator is a data mining tool that generates conjectures about a big data set and then tests them to see if they're statistically interesting. It is the opposite of a finding tool that only shows you what you ask for. It goes through and tries to generate as many interesting possible assertions about that data, and then uh, assertions that can be tested, and then test them, and then gives you the, the, the results, which are namely all the, all, the, all the assertions that actually tested to be statistically valid. And the tests take the form of feature A appears more or less often in the group of text B than in the group C that are distinguished by structural feature D. What does that mean? And so feature A, um, I should add that he had reverse engineered a thesaurus. So the features were all groups of words. So we had a group of words having to do with shirts. We had 100 years of, of uh, English novels. So, and we had it divided by decades. So uh, a type of assertion might be shirt words appear more often in text from the 1850s than in text from the 1860s that are distinguished by the structural feature decade. Because if you have good structural information, you could use other structural features, gender of the author, genre of the, uh, of the novel, so on and so on and so on. 
So it generated these things and then it tested them because we had these shirt words, we had all these novels, it could go in and see what the relative frequency of shirt words was in the 1850s, then it could do it for the 1860s, and then it could go, was it more or less? If it was less, then eh, throw the assertion out. If it uh, met some statistical uh, test and turned out, yes, they're much higher relative frequency, then boom, we have a good assertion, an interesting assertion. <laughs> the problem is, it generated, running over two days, computing, uh, consuming about 100 compute years, it generated 87,000 results. If we had let it go on the full 1,000 cores of our cluster for you know, 10 days, how many thousands of results would we get? <coughs> this is the problem of false positives, not in the sense of an incorrect positive, but in, a, in the sense of a, of a positive that you don't know what to do with in space. This, by the way, one of the things he did with it, not with the same data, <coughs> but with a different one, is he fed it to Twitter. So as this thing generated, uh, he fed it to Twitter and he turned, he turned them into questions. Uh, so as he generated assertions and tested them, he would then uh, sort of spit them out. So why does the word group, and this was using JSTOR, uh, why would, does a word group instant so using the thesaurus, he had a set of words that had to do with the instant, appear more often in the Old Testament than uh, in uh, Old Testament student, which is probably a journal in JSTOR, than in Hermes, which is another journal in, in JSTOR. Uh, why does the word group ground appear more in the proceedings of the Royal Geographical Society and monthly record of geography than in the American Journal of Philology? <laughs> You can see the problem. Uh, I gotta find myself here. Uh, so you see all so the sorts of the assertions we got, though here they were phrased as questions to be more rhetorically engaging, uh, but they're really just sort of cloaked assertions. Um, when we looked closely at the results, not that we looked at all, said 87,000, we noticed a number of things. First of all, many of the results are trivial. They may be true, but they're trivial. Uh, second, many of them are related. So you, we would find a series of assertions about short words, 1820 to 1830, then 1830 to 1840, then 1840 to 1850. And you might have a series of assertions, each of which is true, but if you look at the overall pattern, it's sort of wobbling its way up and down. There isn't, there isn't a really interesting pattern over the century. Third, they're hard to interpret in the dialogical sense. You may find a really interesting assertion, but you have no way to test it. The tool didn't allow you to burrow down and go, well, why exactly? Uh, you know, what, what is the word group instant? And, and what would it mean that the Old Testament student, you know, what exactly is that journal? What would it mean that they're not talking about the instant as much as the people who are writing for Hermes? We had no way to sort of burrow down. And this, I think, is, is a feature that I know we've been trying to build into Voyant, and I think is important to digital humanists doing data mining, is that you always want to get down into the text to try to confirm and check what you think you're seeing. Above all, 87,000 results is too much for anyone to deal with. It is demoralizing. It tells us, tells us something about the humanity of research that we don't want to be handed so many assertions. We want to find them ourselves. What if those 87,000 assertions each have wanted, what if they were all actually so good that they could be a master's thesis? What would that mean? We still wouldn't want them. <laughs> They are false positives, not in the sense discussed above, but in the sense that they are false to our way of research. In the digital epoch, we console ourselves that at least we are asking questions. But that isn't true, at least only we can ask questions. But that isn't true. Computers can ask questions too. We just don't want to hear them. They sound false to us. In Galatea 2.0, Richard Powers imagined, imagines an interpretive AI called Helen. If any of you have not read the book and don't want the ending spoiled, now is when you put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> um, and she, by the end of the novel, can write an, uh, can write an English MA comprehensive. In other words, she can generate and follow literary research. I'm going to spoil the ending for those of you who haven't read it. Helen, 
When she figures out that she doesn't have a body with which to explore basic literary themes like love, commit suicide. And if you think this is a sort of bizarre idea, read Dreyfus on what computers and what artificial intelligence can't do. And there's a whole tradition of critiquing the AI community because in some sense, intelligence is embodied. And Powers is a very smart guy. He knows what he's doing and he's sort of uh, fictionalizing this. Our big data research tools are nowhere near Helen's capacity for, for reflection. But to return to Plato's speed dress, we should keep open the possibility that some of these techniques should be legislated out of existence. And then humanists need to take some responsibility for assessing these. That's what Ashcroft was willing to do on his sickbed, refuse to authorize big data analysis where it infringed on our privacy. Are we humanists and other curators of information willing to step up to this responsibility? Or are we happy leaving it to the engineers who invent these new technologies? Thank you very much. Somebody like to respond to those? Yes. Uh, I think a question that follows from the second point you made is um, that when we make that analysis, often in terms of the humanities, we take for data what really is information in the, uh, in the kind of uh, sense that scientists would talk about data information, uh, data and information, which is to say that there's a lot of interpretational work that's already gone into the data that we're dealing with. Um, when we're computing over humanities artifacts. Um, but, but then the other direction I'd like to go is, is to wonder whether our information in the humanities doesn't immediately become data in the, in the sense that you're proposing data, which, um, you know, when somebody makes a critical study or when one author incorporates the work of another author, whether that's not itself um, an artifact of the humanities at that point, too. So it's a, uh, I know all I've done there is take a boundary, which in the sciences is fairly easy, easy to establish, although not easy to establish either, and uh, kind of diffuse across that boundary in both directions, but it's uh, like, it seems to me computation over a domain, not computation from one domain to another, that mathematical way of stating it helps clarify that point. So. And th there's some good work coming out of the information science community critical of the sort of modern information of, of information. That, that title, I think, of one of the books I was reading, how, how the meaning of these words has changed, mm -hmm. and how, um, and you know, another place where you see this is the word knowledge, as in knowledge management. There's sort of an inflation. We used to be having data, and you know, well, everybody's doing data, so now information, well, everybody's doing information, so knowledge. And What's next? Wisdom? You know, wisdom management? <laughs> Finally, we get a philosopher again. Uh, but, but these these terms have a history. And uh, um, and I think Otle is, uh, the, those of you who are in information science, uh, there are 
uh, words like documentation, the French uh, information scientists are sort of uh, almost inventing this idea of not just information, but the value of having lots of it. That when you have more, you're better off. Uh, and that when more is managed well, you're better off. So I think, uh, and this is one, one of the critiques that, that has been leveraged against, for example, the culturonomics approach, is what they don't take into account is the changing meaning of words over time. That if you follow a word over time, it looks like something is going up and down, but one of the things, you know, it may be that something else is happening, that a word information means one thing in one context is then changing because people are changing it. And just the phrase big data, we're doing something to it today. Yes. Uh, since it's our potato, so we just skip to the end of the chain and do amnesis management. <laughs> <laughs> There's a project on Berkeley Wordseer that yeah. does something beautiful relative to um, building thesauri that are specific to corpora instead of having thesaurus which is independent of the corpus and then uh, you know, generates these sort of random false positives because it's not actually specific to the text that we're looking at. But what I was more curious about is, uh, one, how can you show the, the image at the beginning of the redacted file, uh, the uh, transcript which has sections? I, well, first of all, I just, well, first of that, that's from some of the documents that Epic has, yeah. uh, uh, has gotten through, pre through FOIP requests about carnivore. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons was that lovely picture of car the, the graphic image of carnivore, you know, the sort of meter these are meters that we no longer have those analog meters where it dial with the teeth. So I, I, I just thought you all had to see that. But the second, the other thing was that image shows, you know, when we're trying to understand what, um, what government agencies are doing with the information, what techniques they are, that's what we're dealing with. That's the type of information we get. We get these highly redacted documents. And if you go through the epic documents, I, I actually find them beautiful. The, the, these, these pages with big black marks. I, you know, I think they should be sort of printed and framed and sold to sort of uh, support Epic. Yeah, the Guantanamo Bay transcripts. Mm -hmm. The pattern of FOIA exemptions that run along the side next to the redacted pieces, I think will work their own reading. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question has to do with you sort of conflate uh, quantitative and qualitative data sources and then do the same critique on both. And I'm wondering if you can separate the two out a little bit. And that would connect to this this idea of Patrick was saying that, that you know a lot of the, the data sets we're working with are um, you know there's been human interpretation uh, first of all um, I think once uh, I think it uh, uh, I'd have to think. I think it's okay to conflate this when when the amount of data gets so big that it surpasses our capacity to use traditional techniques on it. So whether you're getting it from human resources, uh, you know, so whether you're you're uh, studying stuff that, and I talked about how we're complicit in creating a lot of this data, or whether you're talking about uh, data that is gathered in some some other fashion. Um, I think the challenge for, for the humanist is, is that the amount of data <coughs> makes it impossible to use the, the traditional research practices that we're trained in, the close reading and so on. And I'm not the first one to say this. I think, you know, Franco Moretti, I think even Brune is saying that, like, you know, when you've got un grand corpus, you no longer have something that you're going to be able to read and then maybe use text analysis to, to try to demonstrate something. You're now going to have to do distant reading or whatever you want to call. So, so I guess uh, what I was trying to do is give a survey of the types of questions we could ask. However, that data, I'm going to have to think some more about that question because one side of me wants to say, is there really a difference? You know, you know, is there such a thing as uninterpreted data? You know, the moment you stick a probe somewhere and gather stuff and not somewhere else, there's an interpretation of where you, you know, if you're just gathering traffic stuff. There's an interpretation of how you design the problem where you stick it. Uh, but having said that, that, that may be a trivial point. Patrick. Uh, maybe without taking that too far, <coughs> the chain to have some kind of 
humanistic solipsism, we could, we could say that regardless of the relationship between the int intentionality of the information that we have, which we're calling data here, um, and the actual artifact, we, we can maybe posit some really strong statistical correlation between the two, right? Some kind of whether the pat pattern for the computer that we're using to compute over this text has any meaning for it, which it doesn't, that there is some strong correlation between uh, the intentionality of that artifact and, and the patterns that are implicit in it. So, so then, without saying that we're, we have data, mm -hmm. we're still able to make some kind of correlation with uh, the creator of the artifact. So. And there, the, the moment you have data that has human intentionality, then, especially if you're, on, if you're capturing it in an ongoing fashion, I mean, one of the things that you read about is that you know, because of the sort of uh, surveillance programs, a lot of people have stopped calling, have started to use uh, you know, the, the very simple and age-old encryption technique of you don't call a bomb a bomb, you call it a wedding. And, and so there is a feedback loop where, especially when it's humans generating this data, when they know that they're being watched, they change how they do it. I, I was at a very interesting talk about uh, changes in how you perceive the internet and social media. There, you know, around 2,000 parents and youth all thought getting on the internet was good. And then somewhere around, I don't know, 2005, 2007, all of a sudden as they're sort of, oh my God, this isn't an unalloyed good. We, we, you know, we could cyber bullying, all sorts of things could go wrong, and that, that changes how people behave on the internet, and so on and so on. So, uh, so I guess that, and, and I think you could, you're right to say that statistically we, sh we could show that some <coughs> forms of data are more likely to have that sort of feedback loop and be and be responsive to the analysis in ways that we need to anticipate anticipate for than others. I think there's uh, I think it's um, in the uh, uh, Gerson Bolter and Gerson in remediation they, they make an interesting point about when you when you have a change in media it changes our perception of what is real if we think of big data as a change in research media, which it may or may not be, has that changed our sense of what is real, of what is really out there that we should be asking questions about? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's, I think it's one of the things that we as humanists should be, should be aware of, that, that the techniques are having an influence on what is gathered because some things are easier to gather than others and therefore that changes our sense of what is an interesting problem and what is an interesting and, and what is real and the Heidegger in me wants to say that that can go quite deep it, you know it infects our language and then it goes it goes very deep our categories for even understanding the world words like data and information knowledge wisdom and so on like that uh, uh, Heidegger's in his essay on the age of the world picture um, where he ends up with this is to say one of the things that's happening is a shift now between scholarship from scholarship to research and it's a shift from uh, neither is better well he clearly feels affinities towards scholarship but it's a shift towards and he calls it busyness it's a shift towards and he's describing digital humanists so the T here it's a shift to projects and going to conferences and being busy and managing large amounts of stuff and producing lots of papers and so on like that and it's, uh, uh, and I think he sort of got it right that that big data comes from big busyness, and big busyness comes from big data. And we all, when was the last time somebody said to you, "Oh, you know, I had enough time to catch up with email. I was bored the other day." No, no, you run into them. They say, "You know, how are things?" Oh, I'm so far behind. You know, we love to boast about it. What are we boasting about? We're saying we're busy because when we're busy, we're important, and we're important because we're managing all this information. That is the hemlock of life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious on how studies like the Agatha Christie one you talked about, how they deal with the conception of the author and like the role of editors. Mm -hmm. And when we're dealing with these kinds of texts, is there such thing as a control group? Is, is there such thing as do we compare them to the two authors we know didn't you know have to mention before? I mean, is that even possible? So he did it. Uh, um, so Agatha Christie, so um, Iris Murdoch, we know she had dementia, and we have novels you know, through that process, and she was diagnosed. 
Agatha Christie, we don't know, uh, but we suspect. P. James, again, had the same sort of you know, long lifespan, writing all through 70s, 80s, or I don't actually know, but P.D. James is still alive. Mm -hmm. And, but, but doesn't seem to have dementia. So, you know, that's a, a small statistical group. And I think in Lancashire would say, um, one of the things you would say is that this research shows potential and it needs to be followed up with careful studies involving medical researchers. But one of the things that sort of shows is, in fact, the, uh, you know, people started saying that Agatha Christie had changed at a certain point, but something like five years before, there's a sort of marked drop in vocabulary richness and then picks back up. You know, it could be that this, this, uh, that this life tracking stuff uh, might be more than solipsism. It, could, it might actually be able to give somebody useful information. It's too early to tell. Now then your, your earlier part of the question is, this is where you should actually read Forgetful Muses, because a lot of the book is trying to impact, uh, well, he's trying to sort of apply cognitive science. And so one of the things he's trying to unpack is the different voices within. And one of the ways he plays that is that there are passages, that at the beginning of each chapter, you have this sort of unedited voice of his inner, I can't remember the name he uses for it, inner author, inner you know, when you, when you have that conversation inside your head, the dialogue within your head, there is the Jeffrey Rockwell, who is the sensible judge of what is being said, and then there's, you know, Jeffrey Rockwell, the, idiot, the guy who's sort of saying all the pointy things and so like that. Um, and I, I, that's my read of what he's doing, but he actually gives that person a voice. So he's trying to, so you have different voices on the same subject, and he's trying to play with that and what we know about cognitive, from cognitive science about the inner dialogue. He does not deal with editorial I just wanted to mention that I'm currently reading a book called The Secret Life of Pronouns, as I mentioned in some other sessions, which is um, almost kind of similar. It's, it's written by a guy who began as a psychologist, but you might call him a digital psychologist because he, is, um, he has specifically developed a piece of software over many years that will analyze pieces of text um, to determine the psychological state of the person who wrote it. And he says that this is actually much more visible in what are actually called function words, so not only pronouns, you know, the unimportant words, the non-vocabulary words, he, she, her, it, mine, you know, but also prepositions to, around, for, by, you know, these things that we, our brains don't even process. And he has a number of, what I find, what I'm finding really interesting about this book is that he is, I think, um, not, he, he seems to not be dealing very well with the notion of Fictionality and authorship. You know, the no, he's, he's he sort of addresses it, but not convincingly when he's talking about analyzing works of creative fiction about you know the notion that this is this is a you know piece of design writing as opposed to something that you're just like writing a diary entry or responding to a um, you know a prompt question. But it, but it's an interesting book and has more to mm -hmm. say about this. Thing. No, I wrote that down. It does sound. Now imagine taking this pronoun, this this analyzer, and hooking it up to your email. I mean, yeah, yeah, I actually. a little agent like a paperclip that pops up and goes, "Hey, John." I'm glad you do that. Yeah. Really you're having a that. crisis. <laughs> <laughs>
rather than reading what we humanists like to call serious literature, massive readerships grew up around popular literature. And it becomes very, very hard to constantly, without uh, inviting the accurate charge that you're being elitist, to defend serious literature against what, in quotation marks, reality, readers, massive numbers of readers, are actually doing with their literacy. So although the, the, the danger that you point out is, I, I agree with you, I also believe that the humanists, who are truly humanists, whether they're digital or not, will be able to filter some things out and to use whatever comes to us fairly responsibly. Well, there's a lot to respond to. Uh, I certainly agree with your, uh, starting from the last thing you said, I certainly agree that we can't handle it responsibly. And I think one of the sort of rhetorical points I was trying to make is that we actually have a responsibility to experiment with it to think through it. Uh, we have the, you know, King uh, Thamos's responsibility to think through it and to speak up about what it can and cannot do. This is not just something we let somebody over there in computer science come up with new algorithms. We, uh, and I think people in information science have a better sense of the ethical obligations of the disciplines that treat information to speak truths about information and technique. Uh, and I think we we have not yet been onto that. And then sort of jumping forward, I think in a similar fashion, we have, uh, I guess I'm, I'm of the view, let's take something like computer games. You know, we, we, we all like to dislike computer games. Actually, I, I love computer games. But anyway, the, the, I think we have a responsibility to not only study certain artifacts that have been identified as uh, high art, we have a responsibility to ask questions, even when we are disgusted by them, to ask questions about anything that a sufficiently large number of people are reading and consuming. I'll give an example from philosophy. Anne Rand. Do you pronounce it? Ayn Rand. Is it Ayn? Ayn? Ayn. Ayn Rand. I can remember as a graduate student, a prof in a, in a seminar saying, why is it that we do not study her in her philosophy? She is probably one of the most influential philosophers, and this is long before, before Paul Ryan. I think, you know, uh, it, uh, there are different competing ideas about what the humanities could be. One model that I don't agree with is that we are the curators of high culture and the legislatures culture. We decide what is fine art and what is craft. We decide what is fine writing and what is craft. That is a model, a sort of connoisseurship model that, that had a certain place in the academy. And I think that I think I have colleagues who still secretly want to have that role. Um, but I think uh, this is, I think one of the points Greg Crane made very, very well was we have to be open to other roles, and we cannot, uh, we've got to be very careful about trying to sort of defend a high ground that nobody is interested in any longer. Um, then you, um, but then the interesting question, I, I, I actually think that with the, when, if we start asking questions <coughs> about what people are really reading, we might actually learn something about why the works that we, that we know are, Fat are, are, are deep, why they are deep. Why is Plato so much better than Ayn Rand? I think if, if we start asking questions about Ayn Rand and read them both and talk about it, we will begin to see, and then we might be able to explain to our students, explain to a broader community why it is worth rereading Plato and not Ayn Rand. I, I'm sure I haven't answered all of the richness of your question. But you did a wonderful job. Thank you very much. I'm Thank sorry. You. I have to look Thank you. So this concludes our unconference that camp day. Thank you very much for all of you for helping make it a
success. Tomorrow you get a bit of reprieve. That is, we began a half an hour later, because it was Saturday. <laughs> so we will meet not here, but in the Kansas Union. That's the building where most of us had lunch. In the Alderson Auditorium, that means that if you come in from this road here that's known as Jayhawk Boulevard, you walk in and turn right to your first opportunity inside the building, it will be an Alderson Auditorium there. So again, coffee and snacks at 8 and 9, beginning with 